We can breed for efficiency, but that doesn't make your cows efficient. They can only work with the resources that are available. But I wish producers would spend one tenth amount of time on their nutrition program every year as they do on their sire selection. Ted Perry, Director of Beef Technical Services with Purina, joins us today as we discuss the value of a mineral program and the nutrition of our cows that allows them to be efficient with those resources they have, such as their feed, their environment, and their genetics. And literally the key to any nutrition program is getting the minerals first, because if we get the mineral program right, then if we have to supplement with protein or energy, the protein supplementation is much more effective and you get more value out of that protein and energy supplement. It all starts with minerals. We'll discuss whether a mineral program should be seasonal or annual and the three abilities of mineral, those being palatability, bioavailability, and weatherability. Join us on this episode of the Working Ranch Radio Show. everyone. We welcome you here to the Working Ranch Radio Show. I'm Justin Mills. We're glad to have you joining us on our program today. We hope everybody is getting their September underway in good fashion. It is kind of that time of the year where you really get your mind chugging along and thinking about fall work and fall activity. I know for some folks, you probably already preconditioned those calves. For others, maybe you're just getting ready to. That's kind of where we're at in our situation. I talked with uh, Denise Loining here this morning uh, in uh, anticipation for a conversation conversation that I'm going to be sharing with you here on our program about uh, Performance Beef, a software program that they use, but they're in Absorky, Montana, clear up there, and and uh, their fall calving, their seed stock producer there, Hereford Operation, and their fall calving. So no matter what you're doing, for folks all across the country, uh, we hope you're getting your September underway. Been interesting weather-wise for us as well. We've had everything from hot weather to pretty cool weather. Meteorologist Don Day will be joining us as he's going to be sharing with us what he is anticipating to see for the latter part of September. Kind of some rumblings around there that we could see some cooler temperatures, but he said don't just get too carried away just yet, but we are going to talk about that with meteorologist Don Day, so be sure to tune in uh, with us for that uh, towards the tail end of our program. Also, before we get into talking a little bit about what we're really going to be talking about here on the program today, I will be sharing with you a little bit of information on an update on the Livestock Indemnity Program through the U.S. USDA's Farm Service Agency. I thought I would pass that news along. That'll be uh, before we have meteorologist Don Day step in. On our program, though, today, we are going to be talking on a mineral program. Always comes up. Uh, certain times of the year, I think people think about it a little bit, little bit more than others. This is that time of the year, I think, when we start to see the grasses really not have the nutritional elements that they would have in other times of the year. And also knowing that some of these cows are have bred up and they're starting to form a calf in there. And so how do we uh, supplement for that? And how do we come up with a nutritional program? And we're going to be talking today with Ted Perry, who's the Director of Beef Technical Services with Purina, as we talk about and answer some of these questions about should we be looking at uh, for our mineral program is it a seasonal thing or should we be looking at an annual and he'll be talking about uh, some of those aspects of it as well like I said in the opening there's some abilities that we talk about when we look at minerals he's going to be touching on things like the importance of palatability bioavailability and weather ability and I know for folks if you fed mineral at any point in time everybody's got a story about their mineral program <laughs> that's I, I think when you have those conversations or when you talk to other folks about what are you using and how is it working for you everybody's got a story and if you look at those abilities of a mineral some of that kind of fits in line with that from palatability to weather ability and he's also going to touch on the importance of bioavailability as well and like i said in the opening you know you know your cow is only as efficient as the resources that she has to work with yeah we all want to see cows be more efficient because at the end of the day we're not just trying to add an another input to our bottom line that decreases our profitability. We're trying to do something here that in the long run gets us 
a re good return on investment? And that's really the basis of a lot of the questions that I have here today when we talk with Ted on this and we have this discussion about our mineral program. So I'm excited to share that conversation here today with you as we talk about mineral program for your herd, whether it's your cow herd, whether it's your yearlings or your feeder calves, whatever that may be. It's a good topic here today that we're going to be talking about. I want to do thank our sponsors here today of this episode of the Working Ranch Radio Show, Vitalix. Livestock is your livelihood. Tubs are our expertise. Vitalix, the true blue tub. Find out more at vitalix.com. And the American Gelby Association. She's a highly fertile, moderately framed cow that raises high-performing calves, even in some tough environments. Now that's doing more with less. The Gelby cow's efficient use of resources make her the picture of sustainability in today's modern beef industry. To find out more, go to their website at gelvy.org. And Performance Beef. Make decisions based on data, not a hunch. Cattle management software that's easy to use and allows you to simplify feeding, performance, and health data recording. From shoot side at the pen or out in the pasture, find out more at performancelivestockanalytics.com. And Tank Toad, your remote water monitoring system, all from the convenience of your phone. It's what we use here on the X-Ring Ranch. It's powered by solar, satellite, and cell. You can keep an eye on your water supply with a daily text message. To find out more, call Metal Arc Solutions today for tank monitors, well controllers, generators, and more. 801-252-6135. Or you can find out more information at Tank toad.com tell them you heard it here on the working ranch radio show well let's stop and take a moment here as we check in with the captain tim o'burn publisher and editor of working ranch magazine for this week's edition of tim's two cents hey justin hey everybody out there in working ranch radio land tim's two cents today is kind of a sad commentary our beautiful home state in nevada finally broke out of a 20-year drought thanks to the rains that we've received here this summer and there's a big festival that's held every year up in the Black Rock Desert of northern Nevada. And this year, the 70,000 people that showed up for this festival, um, many of them driving heavy carbon footprint RVs like, uh, you know, with V8 diesel engines in them, they got rained on. And I watched 20, at least 25 different news outlets cover that story from all as far away as uh, Sky News Australia. And I'll tell you, not, I mean, they covered all the points about the people being stuck there, they couldn't get out, those big RVs just sat and spun in the clay mud, and people needed to hunker down. But the sad part of this commentary is not one single second of any of that news coverage or anything I've ever heard about what happened up there this last weekend talked about the blessing of the rain and what it means to everybody in the rural communities and all the wildlife and the plants and everything. And we have that connectivity. Uh, people like us get up in the morning, step out the door, and the first thing we do is look at the sky to see what's going on. Look at the rain gauge. And I find it very sad that not one second was devoted to how important the rain was. Back to you, Justin. All right. Thanks, Captain. And I, I got to tell you, I was a little confused when you started down your conversation here of, of sharing sad news and then saying that a 20-year drought had been broken in Nevada. Well, in my mind, I'm thinking that's that's great news, which precisely was your point. The fact that for a lot of us in agriculture, we rely so much on moisture and find the value in that, that as our generations continue to be further and further away from the family farm and the family ranch, those people don't see it the same way and don't really understand. And that that is truly a sad state of affairs. Now, speaking of the captain, I thought I'd also mention, as he is publisher and editor of Working Ranch Magazine, another great issue is out. If you don't have it, it's the September-October issue of Working Ranch Magazine. If you want to get your subscription started, it's pretty simple. You can go to workingranchmag.com and you can get started today. But uh, last week, I pointed out some things in there. Here is an article that I would encourage you to go and read. It's about, it's entitled, Of Wolves and Worry, and it's a uh, 
uh, Jennifer Dryden is the uh, the writer of that article. Photos by Scott Baxter and that. But really, it's talking about the X Diamond Ranch. Now that's the current name of it, but it's a family ranch that goes back to 1893. But uh, talking a little bit and going into in depth about their concerns and challenges ranching there in the White Mountains of Arizona and dealing with wolves, dealing with government mandates and uh, other issues that they uh, are finding urban sprawl as well a lot of different things a great article there some great photography in there as well take a look at that uh, issue take a look that article starts on page 74 of the september october issue of working ranch magazine well stay with us when we come back we're going to get into our featured topic today talking minerals we'll be back on the working ranch radio show after this Animal health is key to your business, so how do you track cattle health treatments? Stop relying on pen and paper or complicated programs. Performance Beef helps you record processing data, enter costs, and track animal health history, all in real time at the shoot. The mobile app also makes it easy to log pasture and pen treatments on the go. Your health data is integrated with feed and financial information in one easy-to-use platform, accessible from your computer, smartphone, or tablet. Find Performance Beef online to request a demo. And welcome back to the Working Ranch Radio Show. I'm Justin Mills. As we head into a, a subject here today, especially this time of the year, as we start to see these summer grasses start to dry up a little bit and the nutritional changes changing with our with our livestock out there. So it's important to go back and revisit a little bit about some of the nutritional side of our cattle herd. And joining me here today is Ted Perry, Director of Beef Technical Services for Purina. And Ted, thanks for joining us here today on the Working Ranch Radio Show. Hi, Justin. Glad to be here. Well, as I introed into this, I didn't get specifically into what we were talking about, but what I'm specifically talking about is really looking and, and reanalyzing our mineral program because it is an important part of our management of our cattle herd. Yeah, the mineral is actually huge. And a lot of times mineral can be the kind of the forgotten supplement because we're used to putting it out all the time. One of the problems that we see as far as with constant supplementation is if cattle run out of mineral, you don't see an instant sign. Okay. If you, you know, if they're low on water, you see it right away. Protein, energy, the cows get thin. With minerals, because minerals work in the background and make everything more efficient, all the way down to the room with microbes, which we'll get to in a little in just a minute. But you don't see that instant decline in production with cows. What you see is lower milk production. You see you see slower repro. So a lot of the results of bad mineral or low mineral intake, you see three, six, nine months down the road. And that's the real problem with minerals. But the other, the, the big thing that I think that, that I constantly remind producers with, as we get to this time of year and the grasses are starting to get harder, those rumen microbes need phosphorus to do their job as well. So as that, as the grass gets harder and it drops in phosphorus, if we don't have adequate phosphorus go on those room and microbes, they don't ferment as well or as efficiently. So our, our forage digestibility goes down, mm-hmm. meaning that it takes more forage for them to do the same amount. So our feed efficiency really declined this time of year when we're not feeding the room and microbes right. Mm-hmm. By not feeding the room and microbes right, then those girls are really at a disadvantage here when they're trying to milk hard, they're still growing another calf. She's working really hard right now. And we got to give her everything she can to do her job. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's a good point. And I think, too, one of the things that caught my attention as you started answering that question a little bit was this isn't an overnight deal. This isn't something that you can just put out there today and then tomorrow, you know, you see the benefits. I mean, you'll see some benefits in some short term, but really it's about more of a long term investment, long term planning. As you were saying, there's a lot going on right now in this cow between, you know, the change of of the grasses to growing another calf. And a calf at side. And also, we can't forget, too, these calves, these pairs right. that are out there, it's something that they're needing as well. Yeah, you're exactly right. You know, we're trying to get these girls everything they need. The other thing that I think we forget about is if you look back, if you look at cattle facts data back 20 years, the cows today are so much more productive. Hey, there, there's a lot more output. There's more milk output. They're winning bigger calves. They're growing bigger calves in utero. All of that takes more mineral. And we haven't changed the amount of mineral we have coming from the plants. 
So we have to support it elsewhere. What our genetic base and our genetic potential is outgrowing the forage availability, especially on a mineral side, to get those girls what we need. So that's why we need you know, supplementation more and more. Otherwise, if we have 20 year ago nutrition program, we're going to get 20 years ago productivity. We've got much better genetics today than we ever have. That's a bigger motor. We got to feed that motor and minerals are the place to start. Mm -hmm. One of the things you and I were talking about before we went on air about a mineral program for folks is it's not always a one size fits all across the country. There's things that are different and we all have to take that into account. But at the same time, it's important that we probably give those cows access to mineral most of the time. I mean, there's there's definitely times of the year that's a little bit more applicable than others, but the access 12 months out of the year is probably important as well. Oh, sure. Because with free choice mineral supplementation, the cows will by and large eat two specific minerals. They're eating the salt content and phosphorus. And when we get to this time of year, as the grasses are starting to transition, many times, you know, there might be enough sodium and there might be, and we might be close to, to enough phosphorus coming out of those plants. So you might see a drop this time of year. But keep in mind, as those cows get deficient in minerals, they will go back and hit the mineral a little bit harder. So, you know, we need to keep track of it. We need to make sure we keep the mineral fresh. We need to keep things going for the girls. But but just because you have a little bit drop doesn't mean, you know, the, the wheels are falling off, the sky is falling. Because what we're really looking at is, you know, we want to keep the mineral tank full in the cow. And she will do that based on what she needs. She'll hit mineral different times of the year. For instance, if you're looking at a four ounce mineral, then you want to pretty much average four ounces over the month. If you if you look at any three day period or any week period, you're going to be up or below that. So usually if you go two weeks or a little bit low, they're going to hit a little harder. So just kind of expect that when we're putting out mineral. But getting her what she needs is really important. And, you know, we used to think in terms of we got to have mineral out 60 days before calving because that's when... We're, we're filling the tank, we're, we're building the immune system, we're building colostrum and, and all of that. And then we need to keep that mineral out there through breeding season because we know that breeding helps, it. minerals help with repro, you know, get those girls cycling, help them settling. But what we found lately, if you look at a lot of the data that's coming out with that fetal programming, that minerals are really, really important for that developing fetus as well. And North Dakota State just did some work where they looked at feeding mineral to heifers and the growth rate of the resulting offspring was 36 pounds. And the only difference was they fed mineral during gestation. After that, it was also so that just that developing fetus, that's 36 pounds because that fetus is more well developed on the health side. The, the, the part of the whole fetal programming that amazes me is when they look at the immunity of that calf because that, the immune system is kind of one of the last things to develop. So what they're finding is those calves that are born after a good nutrition program, certainly a good mineral program, those calves have a larger, more active immune system so that when they take the colostrum, they do a better job of incorporating the antibodies. And it sets that calf up for the rest of its life. So it really is important from a feed efficiency standpoint and the fetal development program to really keep that mineral out year round, keep those girls going. What I was thinking about, Ted, when you were talking about that was this saying an ounce of uh, prevention is worth a pound of cure. And, and that's what I look at when I look at even my own herd situation here and looking at where we implement and try to utilize utilize mineral. Yeah, I know there's times of the year where I don't see my cows intake as high as other times of the year, but I guess I feel like I would rather be putting a little bit towards this from a preventional standpoint than trying to then go and, and whether it's doctoring sick calves or sick cows or or hoof issue, foot rot or, or various things of that nature. If I can make sure these cows have at least everything from a mineral perspective, then I've given them a head start, I guess. Sure. And, you know, one of the things I look at is, you know, the reason we have cows, the reason anybody has cows is because they have grass. And if we don't, you know, if we don't have any grass, we don't, you know, we don't raise beef cows in confinement very well because it's, it's they, they use grass. And minerals help them utilize that grass and do more on that grass. And that's like the first order of business. If we do a good job with mineral supplementation, then we don't have to supplement other more expensive protein or energy supplements later on down the road. So once cows are in body condition and good body condition, they do a nice job of holding that body condition. It's our job just to help them stay there. Yeah. Because while I understand when you buy a ton of mineral, it looks like, man, that's a big check I just wrote. Yeah. 
However, if you look at what it does for feed efficiency and and how much it's you and how much it's helping those girls utilize that grass more and the fetal development health side, it's one of the cheapest things you will ever buy for your cow herd because it makes the forages that much more valuable to the cow. Mm-hmm. So that brings us to the next step in this because. For myself, you know, this last spring, I'm looking through different things and, and I'm calling the, the feed stores or the, or the reps. And I'm like, Hey, send me the, send me the label on these, on the different minerals that are out there because there's a lot of different things. There's a lot of numbers. When you look at those feed labels, when you're looking at a bag of mineral of what's in there and certain minerals for certain times of year. So the, really the thing for me as a rancher, I'm like, what do I need to be looking for in mineral? Well, you know, you hit on it because, you know, your ranch is different than anyone else's. So there's certain key things that all minerals need. And the biggest thing that we run into and that we work really hard with with our minerals and in our research is you want that mineral to be palatable. You can have the world's greatest mineral from a label standpoint, just what you're talking about, that label. I can make that label look great. Mm -hmm. But if it's not palatable, if the cows won't eat it, then... We're in real trouble. And it, we get a lot of calls that, you know, cows are over consuming, cows are under consuming. And we work with both our minerals and other people's minerals. I mean, other competition minerals because ranchers are looking for an answer. And that's the fun part of working in tech service. You can provide producers answers that they need. But the bottom line is, if you don't have a real palatable mineral, it's really hard to get those girls to eat it. And what you'll see with low, lower palatability is they don't eat any mineral for a while, and then they just hog it down for a while. In those peaks and valleys, that's not good for the system Mm -hmm. because cows are more efficient in absorbing it when it's kind of at a constant level because when they're really hungry and they're eating instead of four ounces of 30 and eight ounces a day, half that's going right through the system. It's not even getting absorbed, okay? And that leads us really to bioavailability is another thing that we're looking for. We want to make sure that that mineral is absorbable. You look at different sources of minerals like, copper oxide and zinc oxide, they are less absorbable to the cow than a sulfate form or hydroxy form. The most available is the organics that are tied to an amino acid or a protein. So all of that, you know, how much of that gets into the cow, that's important with the minerals as well, because like I can cheapen up a mineral by using less available. Obviously, something that's not as available is going to be cheaper, mm-hmm. but it's not going to do you any good. Our goal is when she eats that mineral, that all of that is absorbed. None of it goes out the exhaust pipe. And then the final thing is when we're talking about different types of weather. I live in Western Missouri. We've gotten a lot of rain this year. And one of the things I'm hearing from producers is that weatherability, because when the mineral gets wet, it tends to harden up like concrete and then the cows don't need it. And one of the things you need to do, and most everybody has a weatherite, what they call a weatherized mineral, it reduces caking up when it gets wet and things like that. The other thing to look for is, you know, mineral feeders and lots of different ways to help with that weatherability. But just make sure that when it rains or something, you might want to take a check on your minerals, make sure that they're still okay, make sure that they're not caked up or bricked up. But when it comes to weatherability, the ultimate weatherability is the mineral tubs. I mean, we literally have the 225 ton tub product. Those are extremely weatherized because you get a half inch of rain, there's a half inch of water on top. First cow up, she gets that, drinks that water and get kind of all the goo off the top and the tub dry back there. The other thing that, that we've joked about for years is that tub weighs 225 pounds. If you get a windstorm and that tub blows away, you probably got bigger problems than your cows are out of mineral. Mm-hmm. But the tubs are extremely weatherable products. We have some regular butyl minerals that people use as a mixing mineral and some other folks, they have really, really nice mineral feeders and they maintain the mineral feeders. They don't want to pay for, you know, the granular or the tub. You can do that, but just make sure that that if you're just watch it every time you get a rain or you get a storm, make sure you check that mineral, make sure it has weatherized it and it's not caking up because once it cakes up, the cows aren't going to eat it. One of the things we talk about is the abilities. Dr. N.T. Cosby years ago came up with the abilities and the abilities that he's looking for is palatability, bioavailability, weatherability. So kind of an easy way to remember that. Yeah. Ted Perry, Director of Beef Technical Services with Purina, is my guest here today as we're talking about the application implementation of a mineral program in your cattle herd. When we come back, though, we're going to talk about, I'm sure, the age-old question that many times gets asked when we start talking about putting input costs into our cattle cattle herd is, are we getting a return on our investment? We're going to talk about that when we return on the Working Ranch Radio Show. 
A sustainable ranch is one that can do more with less. And for beef producers, it can start right at the herd level with a cow that's efficient with her resources and environment. And in today's modern industry, Gelby females are the picture of sustainability. Gelby and Balancer cattle are early maturing with maternal superiority through increased longevity, added fertility, and more pounds of calf wean per cow exposed. Adaptable, versatile, and sustainable. All factors that have a positive impact impact on your bottom line. Gelby influenced females, the smart, reliable, and profitable maternal choice for achieving sustainability in today's modern beef industry. Be sustainable, breed Gelby. Welcome back to the Working Ranch Radio Show. I'm Justin Mills. As we're talking about the viability of a mineral program in your cattle herd, my guest is Ted Perry, Director of Beef Technical Services with Purina. And before we get into my lead up that I left you with in the last segment about looking at the return on investment. First of all, Ted, let's address a bit about, we, we talked about a little bit ago too, about there is some variability of the needs based upon the part of the country they're in. I think there's needs to be maybe a little more understanding about that to know that certain places of the country are different in conjunction to, to that certain times of the year within those regions are different too. So explain that just a little bit more about that's impact on our mineral program. Oh yeah, and that's the fun thing about my job is I literally get all over the country. You know, if I go out to the Northeast, they're, they're severely uh, selenium deficient, but they're pretty good in everything else. And out, out in the Northeast, because they get a lot of rain, they raise real high quality forages year round. So in that area, you don't need a lot of phosphorus, um, but you definitely need the trace minerals and everything else. Um, when I get into your air, certainly drier parts of the U.S., this time of year, we're starting to need a little more phosphorus and we need the palatability much more. Um, also, what we see in a lot of areas, if there's an antagonist, if there's high sulfur or high iron, that's when we need like the organic trace minerals or, or something to, to keep away from the antagonist. But because every region in the country, almost every ranch has something a little bit different, that's the reason why we have over 150 just granular minerals, not to mention the tubs and the meal minerals, mm-hmm. because we... We literally have minerals for every parts of the country and we have regionalized minerals. I mean, it's literally set up for that region just because every parts of the topography is a little bit different and different ranches have different things that they're looking for. So we've got to meet what the girl needs, but we need to meet what the girls need by supplementing what your forages don't provide. Ted, the one question, no doubt that we get into, you mentioned a little bit ago, when you go to write that check for a ton of uh, mineral uh, you kind of have to swallow hard a little bit. And uh, my, my question is, is is the most expensive mineral the best and the cheapest mineral the the less effective? Uh, and how do I get a good return on, on what I'm doing? I mean, at the end of the day, we've talked a little bit about it, about, you know, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And, and, and we understand that. But at the same time, I, I want to make sure that if I'm spending my money, I'm doing it wisely. Yep. And, and that that's an excellent point. I look at it as two phase. There, there's a short term in a long-term view of my minerals are doing the job. And the short term is it literally is, can be as simple as looking at manure scores. When the grasses are hard enough, you start to see those manure scores hard enough and you see more fiber in the manure. Dr. Elizabeth Backus is on my team. She talks about if you're out in the cattle pasture and it looks like there's horse manure in the cattle pasture and you don't have <laughs> horse out there, yeah, then the room is not doing its job. And when we know the room is not doing its job, that's increasing your feed costs because we're not getting anything out of the forage. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times when you add mineral to that or you increase your mineral intake, you will see those manure scores move from that really hard stacked up. It'll move back to more normal scores. And we know the rumen's working better. If the rumen's working better, then you're getting money out of your feed dollar. You know, the other shorter term is body condition scores. As you know, we, when cows are low on mineral, feed efficiency goes down. They start to lose body condition. So, uh, increase that body condition. We know everything else is working better because... Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, we need those girls to calf on a yearly basis and wean us a nice, healthy calf every year. Mm -hmm. In order to do that, we've got to keep them going 365 days a year. And that mineral program is essential to do that because forages alone are not going to meet those girls' needs. Mm -hmm. We've talked about a lot of things here today, Ted, on on, uh, things that are uh, about this mineral program. And you had talked even as we were answering one of the questions, you were answering one of the questions as we were talking about the uniqueness of different areas across the country that have different needs, different types of grasses, different needs at certain times of the year. 
So to find out more information about this, it, it, people are wanting to know, hey, what do I need? I mean, what's what's my deficiencies typically in my area? Uh, who who would I get a hold of for that? So how would they go about finding more information? They can talk to the local Prina dealer or um, if they're just kind of shopping and kind of go, you know, behind the scenes, uh, PrinaMills.com. And on PrinaMills.com, there's Ask the Expert. But with the Ask the Expert, if you type in a, a comment there in the email, that will come to either myself or somebody on the team and we can get you started there. Normally what we do is, is we kind of get some some background information and kind of get things started. But at the end of the day, we want you to go to that local Prina dealer because that local Prina dealer is the boots on the ground. They know what's really needed in every individual area. Mm-hmm. So printmills.com, we can get you started, but eventually we're going to send you to a local Prina dealer because that's the real knowledge base for every area. Yeah. And, and Ted, that's even what I found too, is a lot of times that I'm looking around at different things, they'll know how it's working with other producers in your area. If there's a, you know, selenium deficiency, or if there's a different issues that are key to your particular area, they'll know that as much as anything. They'll say, well, you know, this is what we found in your particular area. So I think that's a good point. I think definitely do the research online that you can, but at the end of it too, you know, go visit with the local rep. I think that's an important part. The, the other thing that we have, um, if, if you're looking to try minerals, if you talk to your local premium dealer, we have a mineral program where it's a 90 day trial and, and kind of get a discount for it because we give you a discount for the price of the mineral in the 90 day trial because we want the data. We want to know how the minerals are performing in your area. The dealer uses that so that when you go to the dealer and say, okay, this is what I've got. What do I need? They can not only say, okay, this is the research that comes out of Gray Summit, Missouri from the printed research farm. But here's what our local producers and many times it's your neighbor. Here's what your neighbor found when they did it. And it's, you know, they actually have the data to show what's going on. And that's, I think, most beneficial um, as you get around the different parts of the country. When you know what your neighbors are doing and you know what works for them, that gives you confidence. OK, this is worth me trying. Mm-hmm. Well, Ted, I, I thank you for joining us. And as, as we kind of wrap up and conclude here, the thought that goes to my mind is, as I feel, as, as we have this conversation here today about a mineral program, I think one of the things I want folks to know is, you know, don't do something just blindly. I mean, we've got so much in our cattle industry where people just, well, that's what I've done every year, or, or this is, we just go and we buy the blocks and we do this and without a whole lot of research. And I think it's important when we talk about how do we get a good return on our investment, I think it's important that people really take some time to study what they're going to do and think about it. And things can change. You talked about this year for you guys and even for our particular area, we've been a little wetter than normal. South, southern part of the country, down in Texas, Oklahoma, they've been dry down there. Things can change from year to year. And as we look at this and kind of wrap up our conversation here today, I just think it's important that people really study this and, and don't just do what we did last year always be a little well, bit proactive. I totally agree. And one thing that, that I wish, and, and maybe it's because I'm a nutritionist. So, you know, if all you have is a hammer, the whole world looks like a nail, <laughs> but I wish producers would spend one tenth amount of time on their nutrition program every year as they do on their sire selection. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Because we spend a lot of time, you know, it, it, it's, it's just human nature, right? We, we spend a lot of time selecting our bulls. How do we want our producer, how do we want our herd to go? Which direction are we going to go? But then we're, we're in order to incorporate and really get the genetic potential out of those calves and out of those cows, replacement heifers, everybody else, we've got to feed that motor. And, and, and you know, that, that nutrition program is key. And literally the key to any nutrition program is getting the minerals first, because if we get the mineral program right, then if we have to supplement with protein or energy, the protein supplementation is much more effective and you get more value out of that protein and energy supplement. It all starts with mineral. You bet. Well, I think, Ted, that's a good way to kind of finish it up here. We've had a great discussion so far here today. Thanks for joining us here on the Working Ranch Radio Show. Thanks for having me. And again, my guest, Ted Perry, Director of Beef Technical Services with Purina, joining us today to talk about the validity, usefulness of a mineral program in your cattle herd. A lot of good discussion today. By the way, if you do have questions, like you said, you can go to their website at PurinaMills.com. And the other resource, don't always ever forget this, stop by your local feed store. Talk with your Purina rep as well. A lot of times they'll know what's going to going on in the county there, what is affecting other producers. And it's a good place to get started if you have any questions as well. Well, stay with us. We'll be back with more on the Working Ranch Radio Show after this. 
There are lots of nutrition tubs out there, but none can match the true blue commitment of Vitalix. Our tubs offer you the most concentrated nutrition at the lowest cost per day. That means more profit for your operation and improved performance for your cow herd. In fact, research shows Vitalix tubs increase feed efficiency by 20% while boosting conception rates, herd health, and weaning weights. Learn more at Vitalix.com. Vitalix, the true blue tub. And welcome back to the Working Ranch Radio Show. I'm Justin Mills. We're going to take a moment here in this segment to do something a little bit different. I don't always read or bring to you more current news, but uh, the captain had sent something to me a while back, and I had something that had also crossed through my email that I think is important to just remind producers about. You may have already heard about it, but that is in regards to the USDA's Farm Service Agency announcing this was the end of last month, where they announced updating the 2023 Livestock M indemnity program or LIP as you hear it called and they increase those uh, payment rates for beef calves over 800 pounds that's going to go from 1244 per head to 1618 that's an increase of 374 dollars now in that I thought it would be interesting to just visit a little bit and give you some information about the Livestock Indemnity Program. And if you're not familiar with it, definitely I would encourage you to stop by your local FSA office and visit with them about that. I know for a lot of different folks in different parts of the country, there's been disaster situations, whether it's been... Uh, cold situations or weather uh, snow situations in more in the north country this last s- summer uh, some of the heat situations that we saw in the southern plains was also con- would be considered uh, as situations that would that would allow producers to utilize the livestock indemnity program it's part of the 2018 farm bill where the congress authorized the livestock indemnity program to provide benefits to producers livestock owners or contract uh, growers for livestock deaths in excess of normal mortality rates that are caused by adverse weather conditions, things like extreme cold, like I was just talking about, or extreme heat or other different adverse weather type conditions. And what that does is the the LIP payments uh, for owners are based on national payment rates that are 75% of the market value of the applicable livestock as determined by the USDA Secretary of Agriculture. And so it's something that uh, different producers have used. I've used it, in fact, a few years ago, uh, about three or four winters ago, we had some pretty severe uh, winter weather and we did lose a little bit more livestock than we normally did. There are mortality rates that they look that up against. And if you qualify, then that goes to the FSA committee. They review those applications. And one of the things I would really suggest is something that I've continued to do and, and record keeping is very, very critical in, in all of this, not only for your own purposes and for your own management, but also in situations like this, where you've got to turn in some of your information and they got to, they got to look and see how that uh, matches up to previous years and, and various things of that nature. One of the things I always tell my crew here, uh, whether it's my my boys or my hired hand, Tristan, uh, is always take pictures, always, you know, for various reasons. Uh, take pictures just for your own record keeping, but also there's situations where you're if you're out there and you do have a high death loss and you've got pictures, you've got documentation, I would really encourage you to do that. That's something that's, that is very useful. And if there's information that you can keep in some sort of a, uh, of a software or spread sheet or however you want to do that. There's some great software programs out there. Uh, We use a software platform to keep our records and it's really easy to print out reports. I can do that based upon ownership or based upon age or based upon various different things. And you can get that information easily and readily available. So when you turn in your application on these situations that happen, you have it at your fingertips and you can easily get that out there. But again, I would encourage you to find out more information on this. Uh, Of course, uh, USDA, this is through the a farm service agency. These payments will apply retroactively to all qualifying losses since January 1st of this year. So even though they, they announced this just a month ago, it is somewhat re- retroactive in that it goes back to January 1st. So uh, again, Zach Ducheneau, who is the FSA administrator, he's a, a rancher out of South Dakota. I really appreciate his response on this. And I got to also mention too, you know, a few years ago when we were in a pretty tough drought situation, situation and they were providing some assistance for ranchers uh, to get hay into your your ranch and it was miles and miles for any of us to get hay in 
it was a conversation I was able to have as uh, Jess Peterson with U.S. Cattlemen's Association lined up a call between myself and uh, Administrator Zach Duchno as we talked about a little bit about how can we also modify this and potentially instead of moving the hay, what about moving the livestock? And later on, it was that spring when they were able to modify that program a little bit for the drought side of things and allow for transportation of the animals versus the transportation of hay. Both were applicable if needed and would ever fit the producer but i appreciate his open ear and open mind into some of this and much similar to this with with them increasing this uh lip payment for cattle and uh, here's just some of the rates on that and i know when you hear these rates it's probably a long ways away from the market price but it sure is a, a little bit of an increase it's helpful for example as we talked about on 800 plus cattle they've raised that 374 dollars to now 16 uh, 1618 dollars on eight plus weight cattle on four to eight weight uh, feeder calves, it's seven hundred and forty six dollars, and under four weights, it's five hundred and forty dollars. On bulls, the rate is one thousand five hundred twelve dollars, and on cows, it's one thousand one hundred and sixty three dollars. So again, just something to remind you about, kind of keep it in front of you. A lot of folks in different parts of the country have had to experience and have experienced an excessive death loss due to weather situations, and we're looking, we're staring ahead of uh, winter two thousand. 23 24 we don't know what's ahead of us but like i said before keep good records take pictures do what you can stop by your local fsa office if you have questions about them visit with them there's some other details that i didn't mention in here not a lot because it's fairly simple fairly easy to understand but they will have more details for you and be able to answer more questions should you have them well stay with us meteorologist don day steps in as we take a look at our long-term weather we'll be back on the working ranch radio show after this. Do you have a young child, grandchild, niece, or nephew that loves the weather and wants to learn more? Day Weather has produced a children's weather journal full of weather facts, fun weather experiments, coloring pages, and pages to record weather observations for every season of the year. The weather journal is for ages 3 to 7 and designed to be fun and educational. The interactive weather projects are fun for the whole family to take part in. For only $10, the Day Weather Weather Journal is a great gift idea for any occasion. Click on our Amazon link to order at dayweather.com. And welcome back to the Working Ranch Radio Show. I'm Justin Mills. As we turn now and take a look at our long-term weather, joining us is meteorologist Don Day with a look at our weather. Don, thanks for joining us here again. We were reminiscing a little bit. Uh, Both you and I are from Wyoming, so we were talking a little bit about the football game uh, a couple weeks ago, or a week ago, I should say, with the University of Wyoming and Texas Tech. Uh, Quite an upset there, and and neither one of us were really around TVs to to watch it as much as we were hearing it. So it's always, always fun to come away from and get a season started that way yeah it certainly is and you know i think with the the air changing and then football starting you know it's it's a mindset thing and you know i think there's as much anticipation for this time of year when football starts and changing seasons as as around the holidays yeah you know? so it's it's a big deal yeah i i sense that too it's just you you feel the chill in the air a little bit you know the mornings or the day is cooler longer than starting at nine o'clock and being hot till six o'clock it just things changing a little bit so you do feel that a little bit and so we talk about that and i know one of the things you have brought up in your uh, podcast weather podcast is looking out as we do here looking at more of long term than more immediate weather outlook but you're kind of looking at that third week of September as something we should probably keep our eye on a little bit. What is shaping up that it could be potentially bringing some weather change? Well, what we're going to start to see, and we're seeing it right now as we speak, there's some uh, low pressure systems that are getting a little bit stronger in central Canada, notably around that Hudson Bay area. And then if you if you put a low pressure system up there and the counterclockwise rotation as the winds spin around that low, well, when you get them up there near Hudson Bay, it directs some cooler air south into the Dakotas, into the northern plains, and up along the east slopes of the Rockies. And what we're going to be experiencing this week is sort of the the first salvo of cooler air that really has a decent chance to penetrate all the way down into Big Bend country. I mean, uh, uh, we're looking at cooler temperatures and good chances of rain down into Oklahoma and Texas, eastern New Mexico, then along the front range of the Rockies, and then we may, over the next 10 days, have below average temperatures for a lot of the nation's midsection that, as we know, in the month of August, had some really, really mm-hmm. hot weather. 
And this is sort of setting the stage for what's going to come later. And as we take a look at that time frame between September 20 and September 30th, climatologically speaking, we usually start to see stronger cold fronts coming in out of the Northwest, parts of Canada, that Hudson Bay area as well. And we see that in our long range modeling. So we're kind of putting a bug in people's ear that we might have in parts of the Northern United States, a pretty good shot of cold before the month of September is over. If we don't see it, I think it would come right on the heels of right around the beginning of October. Mm -hmm. And that's not too far out. I mean, typically this time of the, or that time of the year is where we'd start to see some initial cold, cold spells that we uh, would normally see. Of course, when was it? It was 2006 when Atlas hit and that was the first part of October. So we're not far out from that. Not that we want to see that happen again. When you talk about that change happening and the Northern tier, is there going to be spots of the country that isn't won't see some of the significant or some potential cold weather? Well, I think only the the desert southwest, which will be uh, in a position to where most of this weather will stay east. But I see a large percentage of the country from the east slopes of the Rockies to the Great Lakes, all the way down into the Gulf Coast, experiencing cooler weather for the rest of September. Um, so. We'll be hearing less about heat waves and more about uh, more tropical activity in the Atlantic. And and these cool fronts are going to produce some rain. And I think there could be some real beneficial rains in some of those southern plains with these fronts. Mm -hmm. Well, that can answer my next question, because I was asking you, typically when we do see cooler weather happening, it is bringing some form of precipitation. It, when we talk about precipitation, we do, we're in hurricane season, and I know there's stuff building out uh, out in the, in the Atlantic, uh, down in the southern part of the country. What are we looking at there that's going to affect some moisture flowing in from the southern southeast? part of the country well as it stands right now it looks like hurricane lee which is going to end up being a major hurricane in, in the atlantic is going to take a track to the northwest and could get really close to new england it's something that we need to watch carefully there are you know places like boston maybe new york up into maine but with that track going there it'll take that moisture up and then hook it up to the jet stream across the north atlantic at this point in time the Gulf of Mexico, which is still really, really warm, is going to produce some shower and thunderstorm activity along those Gulf Coast areas. But at the moment, we don't see a tropical storm or hurricane situation developing in the Gulf. So it's going to be mainly the eastern seaboard that we need to keep an eye on, at least when it comes to tropical activity. But these cool fronts could produce some beneficial rains uh, from uh, Nebraska, south through Kansas, Oklahoma, and into Texas. Uh, and even parts of northeastern New Mexico, which those areas have been pretty dry this summer. So they're going to get a little bit of fall moisture. Mm -hmm. Well, earlier in the show, uh, the captain and his Tim's Two Cents was discouraged by the fact that uh, the big festival that takes place down in, is it Nevada? And I'm not f f very familiar with it. Oh, uh, Burning Man. Yeah, Burning yes. Man. And how they had a, a, quite a bit of precipitation down there. And the precipitation in Nevada and in that part of the country has been enough to break almost a 20 year drought situation that they've had down there and was, was just frustrated with the fact that all the news media covered the fact that, you know, put it displaced all these people and the concerns that they had at this and never did once mention the fact that they're getting some very beneficial rain and have had this year. Well, that would fit under the category of good news with the weather <laughs> and Good news with the weather usually never gets reported. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, that's where we're at. But you know what's interesting? That whole Burning Man situation. I believe, if I understand correctly, that it was only a half inch of rain oh, really? um, that caused those big problems. But the the whole event is in the middle of a dry, ancient lake bed. So if you get yeah. a half inch of rain in the <laughs> yeah. desert, all that water is just going to go right to the, the middle of the lake bed. So, you know, that's one of those Darwin Award winners for those people planning these events. <laughs> yeah. Well, what if it's going to rain? Well, it's, we're in the desert. It never rains. Yeah. Yeah. Until you have an event. <laughs> yeah. Well, and when he, when he started talking about it, I was, he was saying he had to share some bad news. And I was thinking, well, what's the bad news? I, I mean, you got rain. Well, yeah, I, I'd be concerned too when the big media coverage was not about the benefits, the moisture that we saw, but rather how displaced uh, some of those folks were in that situation. So interesting how our news looks at things in a different perspective than those of us in agriculture. Uh, absolutely. All right. Well, Don, thanks for joining us here today on the Working Ranch Radio Show. Good talking to you. 
And again, that is meteorologist Don Day with a look at our long-term weather. You can find him each and every morning on his daily video podcast at dayweather.com, or you can just search on YouTube as well and find his YouTube channel there. It's a good way to get each and every morning started. Like the captain was saying earlier, and we were talking a little bit about the weather and the rain that took place in Nevada this last year and in that part of the country. It is something we do in each and every morning. You get out and you, you check things out or you look on your phone to see uh, what the weather's going to be doing for the day. And it's always nice to get a little bit more of a, of a insight from somebody else like meteorologist Don Day that can give you an insight of not only what's happening today and tomorrow, but also the long term, which is what we like to try to do here on the Working Ranch Radio Show as well. Well, don't go away. We're going to take a break here. And when we come back, we'll put a wrap on this week's show. And I'll tell you what we're working on for next week's edition. Edition. And I'll tell you right now, you're not going to be disappointed. We had him on recently, a little over a month ago. He's going to be back. I'll tell you who that is, what it's about when we return on the Working Ranch Radio Show. Age stressed cattle during weaning, shipping, receiving, and vaccination by delivering a multi day supply of essential minerals and nutrients. With Zinpro Profusion Drench, you can keep receiving calves performing and achieve a 16 to 1 return on investment with 20% reduced respiratory loss. Optimize performance from the start with Zinpro Profusion Drench. Well, I hope you can join us next week. We have another great show lined up as I am pleased to have back Steve Cody. Now, he joined us back in July for episode 128 as we did a show, Stockmanship with Steve Cody, Getting a Herd Started Correctly. That was the title of that show back in July. He's going to be back with us here this coming week as we're going to be talking and focusing a little bit more on fall work, things like uh, uh, getting cattle to the corral and dealing with that. How many have you had situations where you got cattle about to the corral and then we have calves coming back. We have cows coming back. Well, he's going to talk a little bit about that. Also, uh, sorting, some principles to keep in mind when sorting cattle and weaning as well. So three things that we're going to be talking about uh, with Steve Cody next week. He's a great resource on stockmanship. A lot of his principles come out of the era of Bud Williams. Uh, he was a student of Bud Williams. And then he literally wrote the book of uh, entitled Manual of Stockmanship. And we're not here to sell the book necessarily other than Steve's a great resource and I think it's really, really important that we utilize him and his knowledge when it comes to stockmanship out there. And I know it's something that folks here listening to the show have enjoyed a lot. I can tell that just by the comments we get and also the number of downloads that we see on each show where we talk on this topic of stockmanship. So be sure to tune in next week. Steve Cody joining us as we're going to be talking and focusing on the fall work of stockmanship uh, for a lot of us as ranchers. We're in that time of the season. While we're talking about previous episodes, please go to our website at workingranchradio.com and you can find a lot of the different shows we've had. Uh, we continue to uh, focus on shows that are uh, that have life, that you can go back and listen to them later on and there's some relevance to them. Uh, we Last week we talked on virtual fencing. The week before that it was a fall and winter weather outlook with meteorologist Don Day. Then we talked with Rick Machen of the King Ranch Institute for Ranch Management on skills needed for today's ranch manager. And then before that, first part of August, ranch succession plan your legacy so a lot of great shows that you can go back and listen to through our podcast site or any podcast provider out there as well well before we head out just a quick thank you to our sponsors of today's program vitalix livestock is your livelihood tubs are our expertise vitalix the true blue tub find out more at vitalix.com and the american gelvie association the gelvie cow's efficient use of resources make her the picture of sustainability in today's modern beef industry. Find out more at gelbvate.org. And Performance Beef, cattle management software that's easy to use. Find out more at performancelivestockanalytics.com. And Tank Tote, your remote water monitoring system, all from the convenience of your phone. Find out more at tanktoad.com. Well, the Working Ranch Radio Show is a production of Working Ranch Magazine, branded number one by America's ranchers. To get a hold of me, it's simple. Send me an email at justin.workingranch at gmail.com. Be sure to join us next week for another great show. I'm your host, Justin Mills. And until next time, keep your chin down and your mind in the middle. So long.